speaker is Dr. Um, Hans Dayweiler. Um, he did his uh, bachelor and his master in sciences in, in, in the University of Alibet in Canada. His PhD in uh, Wageningen University and he's working on uh, statistical genomics and genomic assisted, assisted selection in plants and animals. Thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me today. Um, so I'll be talking about genomic selection in pasture grasses, uh, empirical results, and evaluation of uh, long-term effects. So genomic selection, really what makes it tick is this reference population up here, and that's a population that you have um, done a genome-wide marker profile on. So you have um, genetic markers, distributed genome-wide, and you should have many of them. And also on this population you have phenotypes, so that could be any trait that you have measured in the field or potentially in the glasshouse. And using that information you then use a variety of statistical methods to estimate this prediction equation here. And that's all, all that is is essentially estimated marker effects for all these markers that you have distributed across the genome. And once you have that, all you then need to do is to genotype a single plant or a uh, collection of plants in a pool and um, you can then predict their phenotypic performance based on these marker effects in the prediction equation and also their uh, genotypes that we find in them. Once you've done that, you've predicted their GVVs as, as the previous speaker was uh, so eloquently talking about. Um, once you've done the G, have the GVVs, then you can select individuals take them forward uh, into the next breeding cycle as your parents and make genetic progress that way. And eventually these will be used to create offspring, of course, and the whole cycle starts over again. So this method is really useful for traits um, that is contributed to by a lot of loci. Um, let's say yield is, is certainly one of these traits. It has a large benefit uh, for traits that are difficult or expensive to measure uh, or are measured late in the breeding cycle. Um, and it accelerates genetic gain through a number of ways. One is to shorten the generation interval or the cycle time. The second one is it can increase the accuracy of selection. And the third one is, and it seems to be quite important, is actually it can increase your selection intensity quite uh, effectively. Um, I think in my view anyway, uh, might be biased, but uh, I think there's consensus that genomic selection is overall the simplest and most robust way to use genomics uh, for breeding. And I'll give you a real-life validation in, in another species, in, in Holstein cattle in Canada, and that's essentially the whole validation is the industry in Canada. So this, this figure here shows um, the selection index gain uh, per year for young bulls in uh, every half year. Actually. So it starts in 2000 and in the red zone here that was only on pedigree selection alone. And During that period uh, they gained about 100 LPI points, LPI is an index that they select on, 100 LPI points per year. Once they go into the yellow zone, which is 2005 to about 2008, they started using a few markers, so they would have done a little bit of marker-assisted selection, and that doubled their genetic gain um, to about 200, and here is where they started using genomic selection in 2009, and again, that doubled um, their genetic gain again, and, and uh, they made, on average, about 450 LPI points gain. 
So clearly, genomic selection is working in this industry and is achieving what it's supposed to. So there are several factors that are affecting the accuracy of genomic selection, which I've denoted R here. Um, probably the biggest um, uh, parameter is the, the size of the reference population that you have. So the number of individuals or number of plots that you have both phenotypes and genotypes on. And uh, if you have more, obviously, or you have a bigger reference population size, then of course you're going to have a higher accuracy. The second parameter is heritability, so H squared. And um, if you have a higher heritability in the trait, then you're going to make, or you have a higher accuracy of prediction as well. But the third one, and that's really the one I'm going to concentrate on today, is this diversity measure here, and that's this term ME, which is the number of independent chromosome segments. And essentially, that's the measure of diversity, um, which if you have a lot of little segments, then you're very diverse. If you have um, long segments, uh, chromosome segments, then you're not so diverse. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more later. So if we sort of rank the number of species by um, how what the expected accuracy would be for a reference population of a thousand individuals and the heritability of a half. Um, and we have this diversity measure on the, on the x-axis here. Uh, it goes from not very diverse down here to very diverse over here to the, on the right-hand side, and this is accuracy here. Um, we can see that ancestral populations and also outbred ryegrass, the global population, eucalyptus, um, these are very, very diverse species, and with a reasonably, well, I guess, even small reference population, we would not achieve very much accuracy. But as we move towards less diverse species, so domestic uh, animal species, let's say, um, we achieve higher accuracies. We get into wheat and barley and maize, which are even more, a little bit more bottlenecked maybe than some of our uh, animal species. We achieve higher accuracy. And actually, in the extreme, then, if we go within a family, and with that reference population size, we, we can achieve very high accuracies. So really, um, we shouldn't be put off by, uh, by working in a diverse species. There's always ways to make genomic selection work. So essentially, if you have a, very, if you have a constant reference population size, and you, you have a diverse uh, reference population or population you want to work in, you're probably going to have uh, lower accuracy. If you have low diversity in your population, you're going to have high accuracy. So there are some options to achieve higher accuracy in very diverse populations. The first one is just to increase your reference population size. Um, and I'm talking here probably at least 10,000 or 10, more, several 10,000s of, of genotypes and phenotypes, and really that's, that's out, of, out of anyone's budget, really, um, and it's cost prohibitive. So let's jump that one. So the second one is decreasing diversity. And essentially, it it's means to have a reference population that's specific to subpopulations, and these could be within families in the extreme, they could be within cultivars, it could be uh, within breeds or for chopping animals. Um, it could just be a group of genetically related cultivars. You know, things in your breeding program that, that you've intercrossed for a number of cycles, um, and or even within a breeding aim, let's say. But it does mean um, if you have a quite a specific reference population that that the predictions you're going to produce are probably not going to work in something that's not very related to that reference population. And um, if we have very specific pop, uh, reference populations, then we have to uh, probably more often uh, update, which costs money. So how diverse is ryegrass? Here we have um, a whole sort of a cultivar tree, commercial cultivars of ryegrass. Over here we have perennial ryegrass and Italian ryegrass. And so we looked at FSTs in these uh, populations. And in Italian ryegrass, with FST, higher is, is more diverse, uh, lower is less diverse. And uh, overall, it shows that Italian ryegrass is less diverse than perennial, which sort of makes sense based on sort of the distances that you can see between cultivars. Shorter is, is less diverse. So 
Um, and then perennial ryegrass is, is quite a bit more diverse than Italian. But here, up here, what I'll show in the last bit, we're really working in this part of the cultivar tree. So we're actually not talking um, the whole ryegrass population in globally. We're talking within a breed commercial breeding program that has um, produced some of those cultivars up there. So overall, it's quite diverse, but it, there's still possibilities to work uh, within a group of cultivars on that tree. So there's three things really I'm going to talk about in terms of results today. Uh, the first one is a com computer simulation of uh, a commercial ryegrass breeding program where we uh, simulate an, a, a cross cultivar strategy, um, which is again this more diverse sort of problem. Um, and then I have two examples of empirical genomic selection accuracies, um, one within cultivar and one across cultivars. And then um, I'll try to match up simulation and empirical results. So the first one is um, this simulation. So the commercial ryegrass breeding program. Here we wanted to simulate um, first the conventional ryegrass breeding program, just a phenotypic selection program. We then replaced phenotypic selection with genomic selection. And then we compared genetic gain and inbreeding between the two strategies. So this is the breeding program that, uh, from a commercial partner. And up here we have um, some parents, so uh, populations that are crossed, and uh, lots of sing single plants are produced, F1s. Um, F2s are then planted out uh, in a space plant trial. Um, these are then visually selected um, to go into, uh, or a subset of those is visually selected to go into clonal rows for a few years again, um, which are then visually selected again and uh, matched up by flowering time um, to, uh, to produce four parent synthetics which are grown. The seed from them is then grown uh, in mini plots and evaluated for yield, persistency and various other things. Um, and then once um, the small plots um, are, you do another round of selection and you and select very few large plots, which are then essentially going on for cultivar release reasonably soon. So from up here to the end of small plots, it's about a 10-year process in this case. The problem, I think, with, with these sort of uh, pro, uh, programs is that the genetic correlation between visual selection in space plants or single plants and um, yield in, in plots is actually very low or is certainly very variable. Um, and it's really problematic to actually um, make a lot of genetic gain even though you have quite a few selection steps. So you really need to make progress for yield, but whether these are correlated to yield is, a, is an entirely different question. So in this, when we simulated the genomic uh, breeding program, there's two reference populations that we um, set up. So the first one is the, this one down here, which is for yield and persistency, and that's really the more important one. Um, here we had uh, phenotypes measured in or simulated to from plots, and we had genotypes which were the mean uh, genotype per plot, so uh, the mean of, of 20 plants per plot. So, so um, it's populations that we're actually measuring for yield and persistency, so we have competition effects in there. Then we have the second uh, reference population which is for flowering time, and flowering time um, conventionally is measured in, in these clonal rows, so that's what we simulated. Um, so we have a clonal row phenotype, and we have individuals um, genotype for that. So that allows us then to apply genomic selection at two points, or we, we simulated it to do to, uh, genomic selection in two stages. The first one is up here for single plants, so essentially we said uh, as soon as the seedling is created, we can um, select it based on genomic selection and immediately, not doing any clonal rows, not doing any space plant trials, immediately group these uh, by flowering time, GVV, and select them based on yield and persistency uh, genomic predictions. So right from here, we're going down to the mini plots and, uh, and then 
um, growing a mini plot. Then again, genotyping the mini plot and selecting the best mini plots to go forward into your lot into our large plots based on genomic reading values. So overall, from here to here, from the top to the end of mini plots, um, that is a six-year process. So we've we've shortened the cycle time from ten years to six years. And I think the key point, and we'll see it later, is now, because we have genomic predictions based on yield and persistency in plots, we have a really effective way of selecting single plants for uh, yield and persistency in plots. So we can now, we couldn't do this before, and that's, I think, the key point for, for passion. With genomic selection, if you train your genomic predictions from plot phenotypes, you can select single plants for plot performance. And that has a really large impact on genetic gain. So essentially your genetic correlation, which previously did between visual and plot uh, yields, let's say, um, were unreliable at best. Now, essentially our genomic selection accuracy is this genetic correlation. So we simulated this breeding program and uh, we had four cycles that we um, were meant to be uh, simulating a historical phenotypic program and then from cycle four um, we had a phenotypic selection strategy and a genomic selection strategy and we compared these two uh, various points. So first the accuracy of selection um, uh, for, for the simulated ryegrass breeding programs so this figure is, uh, there's a lot of things on it, but it's this, uh, these green bars or yellow bars, these are the reference population size. So at the beginning we had 400 plots, and then each cycle we added 100 more plots. So we had four, 500, 600, 700 plots. And the accuracy in the individual plants is here, so in the solid lines, the, for yield, um, it was around 0.35, and it sort of went up as we had increased uh, reference population size, and it was a little bit lower for persistency, because it has, mainly because it had a lower heritability. And for in the plots, it was lower overall um, for both traits, and it was quite similar for both traits. And we've done, we've done a bit more work since then, and the reason why it's a little bit lower here is we've had a reasonably high selection intensity in the individual plants, so we went from 10,000 plants to 400 to make the mini plots. And when you have a really heavy selection step um, down here, then we only have uh, the upper end of the distribution. And hence, those were a little bit harder to predict. When we look at the uh, accuracies for uh, flowering time, um, they're much higher. And that's because flowering time has a higher heritability, or we simulated a higher heritability. And also our reference population was quite a bit larger because it's easy, it was easier to amass a reference population from the single plant. So looking at genetic gain then that we can achieve, um, it's clear that there's a massive advantage of genomic selection to phenotypic selection. So these solid lines are um, genomic selection, so for yield and persistency, and the dotted lines for yield is here and for for phenotypic selection uh, are these two lines. So, so this is genetic gain. Then if we look over here at year 20 um, and we concentrate on the blue lines, for phenotypic selection we have about 0.5 and for um, genomic selection we have about 3, so about 6 times the genetic gain that we are proposing from genomic selection over phenotypic selection at year 20. So, that seems like a lot, but let's just break this down. Um, if we look, compare this to um, theoretical expectations, and we just went to the formulas for uh, the breeder's equation in Faulkner and Mackay. Um, if we have genetic gain here, it's the accuracy times selection intensity times the genetic standard deviation um, divided by cycle time. So that's uh, how we did these formulas. Um, if we have phenotypic selection, we have really only one effective selection step in plots. And based on the numbers from our simulations for genetic standard deviation, we got a, a genetic gain of 0.4. When we then um, calculate the expectation for the plots, 
um, in genome extraction and the individual space plants, we got a value of 2.4, which is exactly six times. Um, so we could probably, previously I said we've almost halved uh, the cycle time, so that would probably be responsible for about doubling genetic gain. But really, all the other genetic gain that we're achieving is from this selection step in these individual plants, I think. This is really key to uh, achieve um, a lot of genetic gain in the genomic selection. But there's always uh, a bit of something that we need to think about. And in this case, in breeding, I think we have to consider for, for pasture grasses if we're applying genomic selection, so it's clear. So we have inbreeding on the y axis here and breeding cycle over here. And it's clear in the blue line here, inbreeding from genomic selection is higher than it is from phenotypic selection. Um, and we're working on methods to uh, control inbreeding while still achieving genetic gain. So now on to um, genomic selection in real data. So in in-field, uh, real phenotypes, genotypes from null within cultivars and across cultivars. So first within cultivars, we looked in two cultivars to see whether uh, we could make gen genomic selection work. And basically, all you need to know now is that we used null SNPs and we had about 127,000 of these SNPs. And the um, strategy we used to uh, look at genomic selection within cultivar was a cross-validation strategy. So we started out with um, 120,000 SNPs. They were filtered uh, for uh, the ones with high missing data we removed and also the uninformative markers we removed as well. So that left us with a population or cultivar specific set of SNPs, uh, I think roughly about 20,000 or so. Um, Noel then imputed uh, the, the rest of the missing genotypes and then from that, we got a reference population in which we um, used uh, various selection, genomic selection models to estimate additive and also dominance effects. And then we tested these predictions in a validation population, um, which we then looked at the correlation between the genomic reading value and the phenotype. And that's really the accuracy that I'll be reporting. So in the cultivar alto, we had 188 individuals, and um, we really did achieve quite a reasonable accuracy across the number of traits. The pair accuracy is here, well, it's cut off, but it's here on the y-axis. Uh, here we have autumn, winter, uh, winter year one, winter year two, and spring yield. Uh, this is yield, biomass yield, these four sets of bars. This is heading date, rust score, fructan, and uh, water-soluble carbohydrates. And reasonable accuracies across all those traits. Uh, it didn't really matter which genomic selection method we used, they all were reasonably similar. Um, and the light yellow, uh, yeah, light blue, I should say, was uh, when we only had additive effects. And when we added dominance effects in, that's the dark blue here. And it seems to be uh, of some importance in uh, year two, at least, for biomass yield to have accounted for dominance effects. So there could be um, sort of a transient effect of dominance depending on, this, on the year or the conditions in the year. So if we look at the marker effects, because as a side effects from genomic selection, it's not just the accuracies, you really can look at it, you can look at the marker effects and see uh, a little bit about your genetic architecture and the trait. When we looked at for heading date, um, there was one massive heading date effect that we found in the cultivar alto. Uh, we didn't, I don't think we found this one in, in, tro in, in the other cultivar we looked at. But when we then used the same scale on the y axis here for both uh, biomass and heading date, aside from this really big one, they're quite similar. So both of them really have, you know, one big one, but doesn't, if you have one big one, doesn't mean you have lots of little, doesn't, don't have a uh, lot of little ones as well. So there's lots of small effects in both biomass and heading gate. Um, here, maybe a bit better differentiation in the heading gate uh, graph because it's higher heritability, so it's, it's easier for the models to sort out the marker effects. And really a very similar story in the cultivar Trojan. Uh, here we have fewer individuals, we only had about a 
109, but uh, reasonable accuracies across uh, various, uh, various traits, maybe a couple of them that were a bit lower. But overall, I think that's just a function of that we had maybe only about half the individuals in this uh, reference population. So the last piece of work um, I'd like to talk about is um, the applied genomic selection in a historical commercial breeding program. And um, our commercial partner had really good record keeping and they kept seed of, of mini plots, which was great. Um, so essentially we just went and uh, we genotyped all those mini plots and, uh, and applied genomic selection. And that's what I'll show now. So we had 15 years of phenotypic data available. We had biomass yield measured in autumn, winter, early and late spring, and also in summer. And uh, we had heading date information and no genotype 639 synthetics with his, his uh, GVSSA. We then predicted the reference uh, GVVs from the reference populations of phenotype and genotypes mini plots and uh, estimated the accuracy of genomic selection. And this is the sort of the pedigree relationships that were in our um, set of data. So there's some that are quite heavily related, but then others where we either didn't have that good pedigree information or they were less related. So darker, darker is more related and lighter is less related. So when we do the same thing on genomic selection or on, on the genomic relationship matrix, we can sort of make out that, uh, we, first of all, we fill in these blanks. So we have a, sort of a much more comprehensive look at the relationships in our data. There's a set down here that's reasonably well related to itself, but not so well related to the, these, this section up here, and maybe we can see two sort of different sort of subpopulations up here. And um, we, we just went on and named these guys uh, group A, B, and C. So group A is down here, and then B and C, we sort of, you could, you could say they're different, but they're really um, quite similar and they're quite re a little bit related to each other. So if we look at biomass yield, then um, here, I should say how we actually did the validation, and essentially we wanted to see what would have been the accuracy of genomic selection in this breeding program had they used it as they went along. So we made sure that we didn't use any information. Um, so if we wanted to predict a line in 2002, we didn't use any of the information up here. We only used information from all the way up to 2000. Um, we didn't use the year before because uh, yield trials were run over two years, so we wanted to make sure we didn't have the phenotype of the, the line we were predicting in our reference set. So, because you wouldn't have that when you're actually applying genomic selection. You're only, so when you're validating genomic, genomic selection, you should always think about, well, what if I were actually applying genomic selection, what data would I have available? So in each year, we um, used all the data up to two years before, and that's, that was the reference, and then we predicted um, the phenotypes in this year here. When we had um, all three groups together, and this is for biomass, um, the accuracies were reasonably good, but sort of uh, became a little bit variable uh, in, in the later years. And that is because, uh, I, we, we believe, is because this group A was introduced sort of part way through the program. So up here, you have group A, B, and C, and in the beginning of the program, you have very little of group A. And as, you, as group A becomes more used, here you need to predict quite a lot of group A, but you, your reference doesn't include a lot of group A, so that's why it, you're actually not doing so well with predicting group A. If you only use the two, um, I just wanna show these two groups, so if you only use these, these two groups as the reference and validation, this, these are the numbers you see here, so they're a little bit more even, they're not quite as variable. So we do a better job of predicting within group B and C than we do when we have all, all the germplasm together. When we look at 
So this is average biomass um, across all the years, and here we have um, heritability. This is broad sense heritability uh, in the dotted red line. So it's varied a little bit as well across years, and we have a rolling average of accuracy across years. That's in black, and the bars of accuracy within a year. So at least 0.2 accuracy in in any given year for biomass yield. So quite encouraging, really. This is only in uh, B and C varieties. So now we have uh, looking, we looked at heading date as well with uh, 450 odd um, varieties. And here we did the same sort of validation scheme. So for uh, looking at 2005, we used all everything up to 2003 as the reference population. And the accuracies are higher, again, because um, the heritability of um, heading aid is higher. Um, and they became a little bit variable again later on. This is with all three groups together. That's, again, um, the same little bit of an issue there. So when we compare um, our simulated accuracies, or the, simulate, the accuracies we achieved in simulation to what we achieved in commercial breeding program, they really line up quite nicely, I think. So simulated accuracy, we had about 0.2, and we achieved at least 0.2 in our commercial breeding program. And simulation accuracy for, so this is for biomass yield, and here for heading date, uh, we achieved 0.75 in simulation, and roughly we achieved that in, in our empirical results. So that makes me more confident that what we're predicting genetic gain to be um, is true in our simulation. So, so our simulations have shown large increases of genetic gain with genomic selection, both through decreasing the generation interval and also through the selection of individual plants based on genomic breeding values. Uh, but we do need to keep in mind that inbreeding increased as well. We achieved moderate to high accuracy uh, within cultivar, so I think that is very encouraging. If you have a cultivar, you just want to improve for a certain trait. Um, we achieved low to moderate accuracies, mostly moderate accuracies across cultivars. Uh, the group A material was less well predicted due to the lower numbers it had in the reference population. And essentially that just means that if you introduce new material, um, you just need to build up a reference population for it so you can actually predict it well. But overall, I think we just need to open our minds a little bit to um, thinking that we can, we can actually use genomic selection in an across cultivar setting. And, and uh, that opens up quite a lot of possibilities, I think, for uh, pasture breeding. And last but not least, uh, thank you to Luke, who did uh, all the empirical work and Sipe, who did all the simulation work, and of course, Noel for, for genotyping all these lines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans, for your presentation. And uh, we think we have time for a couple of questions now. Okay, hello Hans. Um, I have a question. When you show the very very interesting, all but when you show the accuracy of the simulation, the first simulation, it's stable in time while the reference population grows. And from what you say, also the population is more inbred. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit of a surprise. Shouldn't we expect the accuracy to grow? Um, so you mean because the population becomes less diverse, you mean you should just that alone should increase the accuracy a little bit? Is that was that your expectation? Plus the amount the increase in the reference population. Yes. So that is a bit of a surprise to us, uh, that it would stay sort of stable. So we did do additional simulations where we um, added more plots. More plots, so then just the, the one hundred in each year. And, and once we did that, you actually did see an increase also in, in the plots. But I think the main one there is it's depressed because we have really high selection intensity in the space plants. 
So then you're really, what you're doing is you're trying to predict the GVV in a heavily selected set. Uh, so your range becomes much smaller, so it's, it's much harder to uh, achieve high correlation there. So I think that's the main thing.